love is showing the character of God. Sharing the character of God because God is love. So to love your wife is to allow God's love to reach her through you. That is love. This word love in the Greek, agape love, is the same love that's described that God so loved the world. God has the unconditional love for us in salvation. That's what you need to have for your wife, that unconditional love. He didn't throw the play away. He promised. He has a plan for us. He has a goal in mind. He desires for us to bear his image to this dark world. So be useful for God and bear his image. Be what he designed you to be. Be what he desires you to be. He desires for you to be his image, to be his representative to this lost world. That's what we ought to do. We ought to represent him everywhere we go. In every situation, we ought to represent him because he is good to us. We should represent him in our work. We should represent him in our shopping, our hygiene, in every situation because humans are created in God's image. Christians are recreated in God's image. We are created by the second birth. We are created into his family. We are birthed into his family and we ought to allow him to shine through us so that when people look at me, when they look at you, they can say, oh, now I know a little bit more about God. In what way are we created in God's image? Does it mean that God has ten fingers and ten toes? If so, then what about the person who has eleven fingers? Is he not in God's image? Does it mean that God has blue eyes? Or green eyes? Or brown eyes? Does it mean that he is that tall? What does it mean to be in God's image? Does it mean that he has hair? What about the bald people? Are they not in God's image? Does it mean that he's overweight? Being in God's image is not about our physical looks. Being in God's image is about bearing his image. Being created in God's image is not about what we physically look like. It's about his righteousness. It's about his moral character, his moral conduct. It's about the essence of God. We're created we look like humans because we are humans. And God might have a humanoid appearance, but we don't know. The image of God is not about us looking physically like him. It's about us showing his character. It's about his essence. It's about allowing his essence to shine through us. So as we bear his image, we will show others what God is like. In every situation, we need to show what God is like. In our society, maybe all around the world, I know a few other countries that also celebrate Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day is a day about love. At least that's what they claim. But God is love. <clears throat> Valentine's Day claims to be about love. You ever seen a movie that the central focus of the movie is Valentine's Day? What 
is the theme of the movie? Is it love? What is love? What is love? Can you name? Can you describe? Can you give me a definition? Can you point to an example? What is love? Almost every Hallmark movie, at least every one I've ever seen, every Hallmark movie is about love. The premise of a Hallmark movie, and if you see this pattern, and you understand this pattern, then you'll know every Hallmark movie. Either male or female shows up to a town they don't really want to be there, or they're there on they're there on some kind of job assignment, or to visit a family. And it's always a small town, like Royston or Hartwell. It's a small town. They show up to town early in their arrival. They meet the opposite gender. The and they don't get along. They don't like that opposite gender. So she don't like him. Or he doesn't like her. It's usually the female is the visitor to the town. And she doesn't like him. She finds him arrogant. She finds him abrasive. She finds him annoying. But for somehow, just magically, he is connected to her family or to her job. And by the end of the Hallmark movie, they're in love. And they fall into love and they either decide to stay together or get married. Some uh, Usually it's just sealed with a kiss that now they're in love. And we're supposed to turn the show off at the end thinking, oh, they lived happily ever after because they're in love. Does love mean happily ever after? When you read a Disney story. Now, most recently, in the past 10 years or so, Disney has been breaking away from this idea, but the tra tra traditional Disney stories, there's a female in distress, a male shows up, solves the problem, and then they live happily ever after. What does it mean to live happily ever after anyway? Does that mean they never have any more problems? Does that mean they're always in love? What does it mean to be in love? Okay, let's get away from the movies then. Apparently the movies aren't helping us with that dilemma. What about songs? You guys ever heard a love song? I mean, what is your favorite <laughs> love song? Or what's the first love song that comes to mind? At our wedding, we had Evergreen by Barbara Streisand, but she, of course, she didn't sing it, but the one called Evergreen, Barbara Streisand sang it in 76. Okay. And that was one, one of the songs that they sang, the lady sang. Evergreen by Barbara Streisand? I, I'm not familiar with that one. Oh, it's a good song. What is another song? <clears throat> Dolly Parton, I Will Always Love You. Dolly Parton song, I Will Always Love You. Dolly Parton does several love songs. She that song, I Will Always Love You, is a great song. She wrote, she, all over. Yeah, she wrote music for other Whitney Houston and stuff, too. So. Was it Kiss You All Over, Exile? Oh, James. <laughs> Dolly and Kenny, Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers did a love song together. Yeah. Islands in the Stream, that the is what we are. That. And the Bee Gees wrote that song. But they're, it, the song is really about... They are, they're in love, but they can't yeah. find the proper timing to be together, yeah. which is sad if you think about it. If they're actually in love, but they don't have time for one another, that's sad. Okay, what's another love song? Anyway, it, okay, okay, yeah. yeah so there's, there's, there's two Indian <laughs> tribes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The male and female from opposite Indian tribes fall in love. They jump in the water together. Okay, Romeo and Juliet. Now we're going into literature. Romeo and Juliet is supposedly the best love story of all time. It is well written. 
William Shakespeare has a lot of talent. He crafted the story very well. But think about the plot of Romeo and Juliet. People refer to Romeo and Juliet as being the ultimate love. Besides the fact that they're 14 years old or so, besides the fact they're so young, Romeo, in the opening of the story, have you guys read Romeo and Juliet or just watched the movie? Or just heard about it? Just for a recap, Romeo is about 14, maybe 16 years old. He just has his heart broken from a female. If I remember correctly, her name is Ophelia. Mm. So that girl broke his heart. He is complaining. He is sad. He is mourning because she broke his heart. While he is sad, two lines later, it appears as maybe two seconds later, the way it's written, then it's two, two sentences later, he sees Juliet. And without speaking to her, he's in love with her. He just sees her immediately from whining about what the other girl did. He immediately transfers, and now he's in love with Juliet. Now, Juliet and Romeo's families, they're in a feud. Enemies. Their two families are in a big feud, like the Hatfields and the McCoys. They can't stand each other. So his family won't let him be with Juliet, and Juliet's family will not let her be with him. So you know what they did? He sneaks over to her house at night, calls to her window, and says something like, Hark, from what yon window light breaks, tis the east, and Juliet is the sun. So he, say, he basically is trying to tell her, you're beautiful. You're more pretty than the sun in the sky. You're more pretty than the moon. So that's supposed to be romantic. If some guy told you that I would rather look at you than to look at the sun, does it make you feel special? <laughs> what if some guy were to come up to you, your husband or boyfriend, I, I think everybody in here is, well, not everybody's married, but just imagine your husband came to you and he said, you know what, baby? I was just outside looking at that moon and it's pretty tonight, but it's not as pretty as you. That's a mushy, romantic thing to say. But is that love? Or is that just a product of love? <clears throat> it's a byproduct of love. What is love? Romeo, after making that speech to her in the cloak of darkness, he sneaks off. Later, they decide they definitely want to be together. They're in love. So does he, as a man, go to her daddy and say, Sir, I know our families have problems, but uh, I'm not my daddy and I'm not my grandpa. I find your daughter to be worthy. I think she's wonderful. And I want to ask your permission to date her. And I'd allow the daddy the opportunity to say, No, you're a Romeo, whatever your last name is. I don't remember, Montague. Capulet or something. Montague. Montague. A Juliet. Juli Capulet. She's a Capulet. Okay, so Romeo Montague. No, you're a Montague. You're not allowed to date my daughter. He says, Sir, if he was being a real man, he would say something like, Sir, I realize that you have a problem with my family, but I'm going to prove to you that I am a real man. And that I can take care of your daughter. And then he would proceed in being a good guy, not participating in the feud, and win over the daddy's heart. Or at least the daddy's trust. But that's not his approach. Instead, he gets Juliet to run away with him. They run to the preacher's house. And the preacher helps them commit suicide. Now that's supposed to be a great love story. Their pastor helped them commit suicide. This pastor will never do that. <laughs> How is that a love story? In the name
scheme of love, the pastor helps them commit suicide. That's ridiculous. But yet, the whole world looks at Romeo and Juliet as being a great love story. Why? I believe, at least in part, one of the reasons is because the world doesn't understand what love is. What is love? God is love. Love is hard to explain. Love is hard to define, isn't it? Is love something you feel? Or is love a feeling? Sometimes people will say about their love, Oh, baby. I've just, I've never felt this way before. You make me feel so special. Therefore, I love you. Is that love? Is love rooted in the feeling that she or he makes you feel? Or is love something else? Who is a good example of being a loving husband? Okay, let's look at, let's look to, we looked at movies, we looked at literature, we've looked at songs. Let's look to sitcom television. We look at Andy Griffith Show. On the Andy Griffith Show, as far as I understand, there's only two consistent characters who are married. That's Otis. You know which one is Otis? The town drunk. And now there are other married people sprinkled throughout, but consistent characters. There's Otis and the mayor. Now, Otis would rather sneak off in the woods and drink than to be at home with his wife. And the mayor tells lies and gets Andy and other people to tell lies along with him to deceive his wife. Are those two men ex good examples of being a loving husband? No. Okay, then let's look at another show. Put Andy Griffith to the side and let's look at another show. You guys ever seen, uh, I forgot the name of it. It's Al Bundy. Married. Love and Marriage. Married with Children. Married with Children. Okay, Married with Children. Now, I'm not condoning this show, but let's just look at the Matter of fact, I haven't watched it in probably 15 years. I, mean, I stopped watching it because it's offensive. But the premise of the show, Al Bundy is the daddy, and his children are teenagers. They do not respect him. His wife does not respect him. He works at a, at a dead-end job, and the people at work do not respect him. He tries to put his foot down in the house and say, this is the way things will be. And his wife does the opposite. His children do not obey him. They don't listen to him. Now, is he a good example of what a loving husband ought to be? Okay, how about another show? Everybody loves Raymond. It's right there in the title. Everybody loves Raymond. In the show, Everybody Loves Raymond, Raymond is pushover, wimpy. <clears throat> He's undecided. He doesn't, the only thing he makes real decisions about is sports. Outside of sports, he don't make decisions. He's afraid of his wife all the time. And he's afraid of his parents, especially his mother. So is Raymond a good example of a loving husband? Yeah. He's a provider. He works and he takes care of his kids. Well, what's wrong with Raymond? I thought everybody loved Raymond. It's in the title. <laughs> well, should we, instead of looking at the modern show, should we look at something older? We look back at Andy Griffith for a minute. Green Acres. Green Acres. Okay, Green Acres. In Green Acres, there's a few people in Green Acres who's married. The main character, Mr. Douglas, who for some bizarre reason wears a complete suit while on the tractor in the middle of the summer in the South. That doesn't make any sense. What? 
He loves his wife so much, he leaves the penthouse in New York and puts her in a run-down house where it's fall and literally falling apart. So, because of his desire to be there. Is that love? Okay, what about Mr. Zuckerberg? Ar Arnold's owner. Mr. Zuckerberg, however you say his name. Well, he's married. Zuckerberg. You mean Zuckerberg? No, Arnold the pig. Oh, Arnold's, I mean, I'm thinking Arnold's owner. Schwarzenegger? No, no, the pig. <laughs> no. The, you guys know who Arnold is on Green Acres, the yeah, pig. I don't remember the name. Okay, Arnold's humans. They're married. But the guy is frequently talking bad about his wife. How about Howard Hughes? Not the Howard Hughes, but on the Green Acres, Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes on the Green Acres is married. But he runs and hides from his wife all the time. He says the reason he keeps 40 acres is so that he can get lost and she can't find it. No, that's a loving husband right there. Okay, so we've looked at sitcoms, we've looked at literature, we've looked at songs, we've looked at these avenues that our society claims is love. If we can't find an example of true love there, where can we find an example of true love? What, where can we possibly look to find true love? How is a man supposed to treat a woman? How is a man supposed to show the woman he loves her? According to our society, he's supposed to go buy the biggest box of candy and load her down with sugar so she'll stay skinny. But he goes and spends $70 on candy in a box shaped like a heart, then takes the girl, the lady, out to, for a dinner, depending on where you live, you'll spend sixty to eighty dollars that night on dinner. And if you go to the movies, get movies and popcorn and a drink, that's another sixty dollars. Then afterward, you do something for free. You go for a walk. Is that really showing her you love her? Now, there's nothing wrong with going on a date. If you want to go on a date, go on a date. I'm asking, is that the way to show love? On one hand, yes, it is, because you're showing detailed attention to her. So you're showing her she's important, and that is, in one way, showing love. But is that the real example of love? So should every man do that? Should every man go and buy dead flowers and take to the woman that she'll throw away in three days? You can write your is, fiance a poem or something. You're good at writing true. a poem. So is writing a poem or writing yeah. a letter? Yeah. What is the ultimate example? How should a man treat a woman? Women, how do you want your man to treat you? What do you want him to do? Do you want those flowers? Do you want a song about jumping in the lake? Do you want do you want the big fancy house and the fancy car? Do you want your husband to be wimpy like Raymond? What do you want from your husband? Let's look to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 tells us no, Ephesians is telling us how to live in unity as church people. As people who believe in Jesus, we ought to have unity. So Ephesians is telling us how to live in unity as the body, as the church of Christ. Not the denomination, but as the people who belong to Christ. So Ephesians is telling us how to live in unity with other believers. We're to walk in love, the love of God. We're to walk in the light as the new man of God. 
the new human, not just man as in male, but male, female, the new human. As the new human in Christ, you are to walk in the light of Christ, walk in the knowledge of his truth. As you walk in that knowledge, you allow his light to shine through you. So that's living in unity. And you walk in the wisdom of Christ. As you know, as a Christian, you are to have the mind of Christ. You are to be transformed by the renewing of your mind by feeding yourself God's word. So you walk as the new human. You walk in the light of Christ, in the wisdom of Christ. So that's your relationship with other believers. But to be more personal, Paul says, this is how you treat your spouse. So within marriage, you need to be an example of Christ to your spouse, especially the men. Men, it's your responsibility to show the love the wisdom of Christ to your wife. It's your responsibility to be the light of Christ in your home. It's your responsibility to show. When Christ is, when Paul is explaining what a real man of love, what a real man is supposed to do, he doesn't look to literature. He doesn't look to popular <coughs> culture. He, he looks to Christ. He doesn't even look to the Old Testament and say, treat your wives the way Moses treated his wives. He don't say, treat your wives the way Joseph treated his wives. Or, treat your wife the way Jacob treated Leah. That would be bad. Treat your wife the way Abraham treated Sarah. <coughs> no, he doesn't look to these examples because Abraham <coughs> did not treat Sarah Correctly all of the time. Jacob didn't even love Leah. David didn't, wasn't faithful to his one to one wife. He had other wives and concubines. So how can we find an example, even from the Bible? How can we find an example to treat our wives correctly? Paul says the only one. The best one that we can look to know how to treat our wife is by looking to Jesus Christ. We are to look to him as our example. We are to look to him as the one for us to emulate. We ought to look to Christ so that we know how to treat our wife with the respect and honor that she deserves. So let's read what Paul wrote. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5. We will begin reading in verse 22. Earlier, he's talking about walking in wisdom. And within that wisdom, he tells us to be led by the Spirit. In verse 18, he tells us to be filled with the Spirit of God. So in verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So there you go, husbands, right there. You lord over your wife, and you'll be good. Is that what we're supposed to take from that? Mm -mm. No. You know, traditionally, men have understood this as meaning, basically, to explain the way they handle it, is I get to be chauvinist. Control. Yeah. I control my wife. I control my kids. Because I'm the lord of the matter. If you just look at that one verse, you'll be deceived into thinking that, won't you? Well, let's read the rest and see what Paul's explaining. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. So there you go, men. You're the head. So Lord over her. As also Christ is the head of the church. And he is in, excuse me, and he is the Savior of the body. <clears throat> Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So wives, 
be subject to your husband the same way the church is subject to Christ. Does this mean, please understand, listen carefully, so you don't think I'm telling you something that I'm not telling you. I'm simply asking a question. Does this mean you are supposed to accept your husband's word as the gospel truth? Well, you're supposed to accept like the church accepts Christ. Does this mean that you're supposed to wash his feet because Mary washed Jesus' feet? Does this mean that you're supposed to be to have the fear of your husband the same way the church has the fear of the Lord? Well, what does it mean then? We will understand how the wives are supposed to treat the husbands when we understand how the husbands are supposed to treat the wives. When we understand how the husband is required to treat the wife, it puts into context what it means for the wife to submit to the husband. And just to be clear, before you make sure that nobody misses this point, husbands, you are not commanded by God's word to be the boss of your wife. You are not commanded, you are not permitted to lord over your wife. Wives submit to the husbands is the same way when we back up, go back to verse 21. Actually, go back to verse 20 and then 21. Giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. That's the same word. Submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. That's talking about the community of believers. So wives, do you allow every Christian to run over you and be your master? If not, then apparently that's not what Paul is saying because it's the same exact word. The husband is not the master, the boss, controlling the wife. There's something else going on. Wives, submit to your husband the way you submit to other Christians. So you treat with honor the same way you treat Christians with honor. It is a little bit more than that, and we'll understand as we go. So verse 25, husbands, now notice something here. This is three times as much content to the husband as it is to the wife. Count the verses. It's three times as much information, three times as much Detail instruction given to the husband as it is to the wife. Because the husband has the greater responsibility. The husband has more to do. The husband is more has more instruction and a way to take care of the wife. Husbands, love your wives. Okay, so how do you do that? How do you love your wife? Does that mean that you just have this goose bump feeling and tell your wife, oh, nobody's made me feel like this before. Is that love? So love is showing the character of God. Sharing the character of God because God is love. So to love your wife is to allow God's love to reach her through you. That is love. This word love in the Greek, there are four words for love. This word love is the agape love. It's the same love that's described that God so loved the world. God has the unconditional love for us in salvation. That's what you need to have for your wife, that unconditional love. Some guys say that I love her I did love her, but I fell out of love with her. You won't 
You can't fall out of love with somebody. You can choose to stop loving them. Love is a choice. Now, feelings do come along with love. But once those feelings are gone, you still have the choice to choose to love. Love is a choice. Paul is telling us as a commandment, husbands, love your wife. You have to be active and intentional. Love your wife. And you love your wife not only now, but you continue to love your wife. The way this is worded in the Greek, this word has no ending to it. There is no stopping. It is always from this point now and always forever continue loving your wife. Husbands, what you ought to do when she burns the food, you ought to love her. When she is angry and yelling at you, you love her. When she invites her mother to come stay with you, you love her. When she breaks the car window, you love her. When she doesn't take the car in to get the oil changed and the engine blows up, you love her. Regardless of what mistakes she makes, you love her. You share the love of Christ with her. Allow his love to shine through you to her. Now that's a lot easier said than done, isn't it? Husbands, you need to get into the word. We need to get into the word and stay in prayer so that we can obey this command. We cannot do this unless we remain connected to God. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Husbands, you need to be a sacrificial to your wife as Christ is to the church. So where does it end? It ends by you laying your life down for her. Christ laid his life down for the church, didn't he? That's what Paul is saying. This is how you love your wife. You give your life for her. Now that doesn't mean, husbands, you need to go out looking for a bullet to jump in front of. I'm not telling you to go die. I'm telling you that you serve her. Remember, Christ said, I didn't come to serve. Christ did not say that he came to be served, but rather he said, I came to serve. Let me say that again because I got my tongue twisted a minute ago. Christ came to serve. So husbands, take the example of Christ and you live with your wife in service. You serve your wife with the love of Christ. He might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Christ sanctifies the church. He sets the church apart. Christ's primary instruction, Christ's primary interest in the church is her cleanness. Christ's primary interest in the church is the holiness of his bride. We are to be a bride for Christ without wrinkle, without spot, and without blemish. He is interested in our holiness. So husbands, you ought to be interested in the holiness of your wife. You ought to do things in such a way that it will make her or encourage her to draw closer to God. When you are complaining and yelling and fussing, does it cause her to want to draw closer to God? You need to encourage her with everything you do think about how can i encourage my wife to draw closer to god you ought to be concerned about her spiritual welfare and you cleanse her with the word of god so have regular bible studies with her encourage her to study god's word so that she will be transformed into the image of christ so husband verse 28 so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So love your wife. Don't do anything to her or against her that you would not do to yourself. 
You need to treat her as your own body. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. That does word there, nourish, is like a mother with a newborn baby. So you need to treat her, love her so much that you mother over her. Husbands, treat her as, like she's a fragile newborn baby and nurture her and honor her. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nurtures and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh, and of his bones. Does that sound familiar? That's what Adam said of Eve, isn't it? She is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. And we learn from Genesis that for this reason, marriage, for this reason of marriage, the man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And the two shall be one flesh. So husbands, if you're constantly running back to your mommy, then you're not leaving your mother and father. This doesn't mean that you can't have a relationship with your parents, but this means that you need to become the head. You need to be a man that works and provides for your family. Don't try to live off of your parents and definitely don't try to live off of her parents. You need to be a man that works and takes care of your own family. How can you be the man of the house, the head of the house? How can you be the representative of God in that home when you are dependent on your parents? How can she see you as a provider when you're getting money from daddy? You need to be the independent one. You need to be standing on your own two feet and providing for your wife, showing her that you love her. You need to be a man, a real man, willing to work and provide. There's nothing wrong with receiving help. I'm not saying don't accept help. I'm saying don't be lazy. I'm telling you that it's wrong to be lazy. We need men who will be biblical <coughs> men, honoring and nurturing their wives and being providers for their wives and their families. Verse 30, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So just as Christ is united with the church, husbands, you ought to be united with the wife. Nevertheless, let each of you, in practical, so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respect her husband. So wives, it's your choice to show him respect. There are some people who claim, husbands, if you do exactly what you're supposed to do, then the wife can't help but to fall in line. If you truly love her the way Christ loved the church, then she will be the wife she is supposed to be. That's not true. Husbands, you can do everything you're supposed to do, and she can still choose to dishonor you, still choose to disrespect you, and still choose to go outside of the home. It's her choice right here. Paul tells her to be mindful and respectful of you. It's her choice. So don't think that if you do everything you're supposed to do, it forces her to be a good wife. But what do you do even if when she decides not to be a good wife? You still be a good husband. You are commanded by God's word to be a good husband and a representer of Christ. So you do what you're supposed to do. You love her. You show her that love. You spend that quality time. And you sanctify her unto God. You treat her as one who is 
property of God. You treat her as the daughter of God. You show her the honor that you would when you realize my wife is God's daughter. You treat her with that honor and respect that Christ shows the church. So husbands and wives, you have a big responsibility. We have a big responsibility to obey God's word. And we cannot do this without staying in the word and prayer. So we ought to pray and we ought to study God's word together as husband and wives, as family. We ought to study God's word together so that we can grow together in him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to study your word. Thank you, Lord, because you are so good to us. Thank you, Lord, because you are so wonderful. Help us, Lord, to follow after you. Help us as husbands and wives to be submissive to one another. Help us as husbands to love our wives the way Christ loved the church so that we can be in complete obedience to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.